Well, that's not working. All righty. Well, I'll just cut to myself then. Um, so welcome. I don't know uh, whether or not you could hear that or not. Let me know if you could hear Wes while he was talking. I assume you couldn't, which is why I stopped it. And um, God, we've just had challenges after challenges, right? Uh, the last couple of minutes. I don't know if you guys are aware of this, but the Facebook feed is down currently at the moment, or it was, which is why we sent, oh no, I see a lot of people are watching on Facebook, which is kind of weird. So maybe it's not down everywhere, but, uh, hmm, interesting. No sound from Wes. That might be a problem. Um, because, uh, one of the things I wanted to do today was play a video for you, which will be problematic if, um, if you can't hear videos. So let me just see whether or not, let me first play the beginning of uh, the CSIB video and let me know if you can hear the beginning of this video. All right. And um, so, yeah, let me, tell me if you uh, hear this. So could you hear that? So Tahoe Cal said no. You could not hear that. All right. And Gwevin said no. The sound is very low, but you can listen. Okay, so but the sound was volume is really low okay so hold on a second let me see if this is uh yeah it shouldn't sound really low though um i don't mind stefan um hmm okay hold on a sec i'm just i want to get the audio working though guys so hold on a sec let's see here um Let's unmute that. All right. Tell me, and let me just take a look at what this is for a second. Uh, hmm. All right. Oh, cam and mic. Let's see. Okay. Audio. Audio is okay. So let's see if I change this to this. All right. So that'll, that should be better. And then um, I'll make this also um, just this, all right. And echo cancellation. All right, yeah, let's, okay, let's take a look now. All right, so um, yeah, we're not talking about me though. Now, let me know if you can hear this at a normal volume, a normal volume. I'm gonna play the beginning of the intro again, okay? I'm gonna to wanna to pay extremely close attention. The rules are changing. If you don't know this information, you're more likely to be on the losing side than the winning side. I'm really excited about this. Michael Tate, Katrina Ruth, Brian Dice, the one and only Russell Brunson. Sonia Riccati, we have Molly here, Todd Brown, Roland Frazier, Michael Jeff Walker, Neil Kelsey, Dennis Yeah, so then that must, you must still be hearing it through my mic, I guess, which is really strange. Son of a bitch. All right. Well, um, 
what I was planning on doing was uh, playing for you guys a half an hour video of an interview I did with Michael Francis or Francis rather, um, but uh, not going to have it. Um, doesn't seem like it's working the way that it should. Yeah, it must be coming through my mic and I'm not really sure what I can do about that. The only thing I can do is check Ecamm, which is where I'm playing it from. Although I wonder if I can just like, maybe I can add a, can I add a, oh, I think I could just add it to, I think I can add the video to, I can, I think if it's, no, I think the clip is going to be too big. I think, um, can I, Add a video. Yeah, it's too big. Hmm. All right. Yeah. That's not going to work. All right. And is there any place else to add a video? Um, camera. Show advanced. Yeah, that's not going to work. All right, guys. So don't want to waste any more time on this. Um, bummer about that. Um. But I guess it is what it is. So um, I guess I will have to actually put that up at a... Well, I'm going to still see... How would I do this? Let me, the only other thing I could look at is if Ecamm doesn't out. Let's see. Output. Audio monitor. Um, huh. Okay, so that's where it's sending it. Maybe if I sent it to the... Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I bet you there's a way I could be doing this, and I just am not smart enough. Uh, oh, well. Anyway. So, all right, guys. Apologize about the challenges. For those who don't know, my name is Rich Sheffrin. I do these live streams every Tuesday and Thursday. Normally, uh, or at least recently, we haven't had any challenges. And so I got rather ambitious. I just actually got back from uh, Los Angeles. And while I was there, I got the opportunity to sit down with Michael Francis and uh, he was really a, a gentleman, a really nice guy, and um, was able to snag a 20 to 30 minute interview with him. For those who don't know who he is, he is the um, he's the biggest money maker in organized crime history. He's the only person who was able to leave the mob without ratting on a lot of people. Um, or anyone. He is was profiled in uh, Fortune Magazine did a article back in the 80s of the top 50 mob bosses uh, of those 50. Um, all 49 other than Michael, he was in that list. Um, all other 49 are either dead or have are serving life in prison. And uh, so that is Michael Francis. Uh, if you ever heard about the mafia scamming the government out of about $2 billion or so of gas tax money, that is Michael Francis. So anyway, I got the chance to sit down with him and it just so happens he knew some of the people that I hung around with as a kid, the guys that were in the book Wise Guy, which the movie got, uh, Goodfellas was based on, the guys that I hung out with did not make it into, um, they didn't make it into the uh, movie, but they were in the book. And so I thought it'd be kind of cool to talk about what I was talking to Michael about, which was, you know, the lessons that can be learned from the street that uh, um, that apply to entrepreneurship. Because for those of you that aren't aware of this, um, generally in a crime family, um, the their 
you can break up the the members of the organization. Um, uh, one way you could do this is by labeling uh, one group uh, thugs, muscle, um, brawn, right? And the other side, the other grouping, you could call the earners or the brains, right? And um, so I knew an earner. Michael obviously was an earner. Um, and, you know, my belief is, is that anyone that earns a lot in that way of life could easily also earn a lot in the legitimate ways of life. Um, and so I think there are a lot of lessons to be learned. And the, especially in a environment uh, where you also are competing with a lot of other unscrupulous players. And so how do you, you know, make deals and at the end of the day, right? Um, my, my advice to Michael was that I believe that where their back, his back end would best be served would actually be in a back end centered around deal making. Because as a successful mobster, at the end of the day, um, it's all about making the right deals. And so much in business can be said that success in business is making the right deals. Because when you think about it, um, making the right deals with the right people determine whether you have the right team, right? Um, and ultimately, everything that you do in a, in a business revolves around deals and negotiations and things of that elk. So anyway, so that's why I thought that we would talk about it. For one, the uh, uh, another reason being that I've, I've shared this in the past that I learned a lot at the side of my dad. My dad was a um, extremely tough business guy. Um, also somewhat of a sociopath. And so I got to learn a lot by his side. Um, certainly some of the things being what I never would want to do, but others actually learning um, quite a bit. And then lastly, the guys that I hung around with, I learned quite a bit from. So uh, over the years, I've been fortunate enough to have learned many lessons from many wiser people than me. And so I thought it'd be fun to discuss that. And you can certainly hit me up with as many questions, Stefan, as you want. And uh, so let me say hello to all of you. If you're watching this right now, uh, please give me a shout out. Let me know where you are. Um, and it's always nice to know who I'm talking to. And then in general, as I do these live streams, I really try to foster these as being as much of a dialogue as opposed to a monologue. I love any questions or comments that you have. Um, if you have any questions, I am happy to take them and answer them. And uh, I actually wanted to sit down tonight. Hey, Mars, what's up? Uh, and uh, I thought, oh, I hope I'm tall enough when I put up the... Uh, the uh the titles and uh remove the super already what's the super oh i don't know um all right so uh let's just remove remove the super already not sure what that means but okay uh no i'm not i'm streaming through Streamyard and through uh ecamm since i still have ecamm Right. So that's the idea there. Um, you could edit OBS directly, right click and transform fit the screen. I wish wish I could do that with StreamYard. Um, and maybe I could. Uh, I just don't know how. <laughs> uh, should have asked Michael Francis. Michael France sees uh, on how to make an irresistible offer. Yeah, I think he uh, 
many of us are not in the same position where we could make offers like that, but that is funny. Um, let me stand up taller this way. Uh, it was, I see, I don't think I've been watching his YouTube and joined his website. Very cool. Um, there are muscles and money makers. Exactly. And, uh, Hey Rich, what's up with the tattoo on your neck on the front in one of the video editions? Uh, are you thinking of getting one? No, I mean, I, I put different tattoos on at different times, but they're all fake. Um, I'm Jewish and my mom would cry if I got one and I don't want to see her cry. Uh, greetings, Carlos in Venezuela and Stefan. What is he doing right now? Um, yeah, well, he's speaking and, uh, selling books and, uh, he's working with, uh, some guys I really respect, Julian and Kurt, and, uh, they are helping build out his back end. Uh, it's the same guys that work with Wes Watson and, um, I was there, one, to do the video with him, but two, to give any advice I could on what would be the ideal back end for them. I was hoping it would just be pure business, but and then I could do something with them. But uh, when they gave me a perspective of the different groups that were watching Michael's videos, um, I thought it was too disparate, you know, uh, to th as far as business wouldn't apply to a good percentage of the people that watch him, whereas deal making would apply to everyone. So um, that was why that was my advice. Uh, yeah, you can offer a deal they can't refuse. What up, Mars? Um, greetings, Lewis in Mexico. Always good to see you. And Roberto from Spain. What up? And Milos in Serbia in the house with Stefan <laughs> uh, and Jason in Tampa, as usual, my friend. And Ned in D.C. and Jane in D.C. Thank you for sharing. Yes, if you share it, put hashtag shared so that I can thank you personally. The mob was in Great Neck. No, the mob was not in a Great Neck, although there was a Peter Luger's in Great Neck. And um, I asked Michael if he ever went there, and he said, quite often, actually. So, um, no, I didn't meet anybody in the mob in Great Neck. Not at all. Um, ha ha, Mark Francis. <laughs> uh, hey, Rich, thanks for everything. I enjoy to learn from you. Well, thank you, Jay Roca. And so, what's a sleeve? Hmm? So that's what a sleeve is. Oh, a sleeve is an arm tattoo, right? Chilling with you from West Laco, Texas. Cool, Hector. Nice to meet you. Um, Jesse, what's going on? If I want to renew another year of Steal Our Winners, do I do it inside my account, email support, or just re-sign up at strategicprofits.com? I think um, you're better off hitting up support, Jesse. Um, yeah, I think you're better off hitting up support, but you should have gotten emails on it. And the fact that you didn't is concerning. So definitely hit up support and ask them why you didn't get renewal notices. Uh, what did I discover his audience to be? Oh, well, his audience was just the people that had joined his, whatever his inner circle thing is called, um, was a wide variety of people from real estate brokers to personal trainers to online marketers to wealthy people that just uh, want to be, well, they don't always have to be wealthy, people who wanted to be entertained, et cetera. So it was much more uh, diverse. It, whereas like a course like, the first thing they developed was something like how to be an online person, which made no, n real no sense to me. Even business would be more appropriate than that. But when I heard what it, the people were, I was like, yeah, well, business would be better, but actually deal making would be superior. Don in Ireland. Nice to meet you, Don. Like the picture and the hat. Uh, Eric in the Bronx. What up, Eric? 
And Romeo, good to see you, my friend. Although we don't know where you are, Romeo. Uh, I need a technical guy in those lives. Technical stuff is irritating, right? Tell me about it. Tell me about it. Mars is working on that for me. <laughs> rock. All right. Uh, shared. You rock, Jesse. And uh, yes, I got that. Oh, did I just... Oh, pronounced like rock. So is it just J-Rock? But all good. <laughs> Checking in from Southwest England. Cool. Yeah, no emails. That is strange. Uh, Tiana from Reno, Nevada. Cool. All right. And Romeo's in the UK. Wow. All right. So, um, yeah, throw some questions at me. One of the things, though, that I've certainly noticed, and this was something that I wrote about in the Hidden Obstacles report, that um, that one thing for sure that I noticed in all of the successful clients that I've had um, is a a confidence of their ultimate success, not necessarily like a false confidence on any particular project, but an, a long-term kind of, I know that I will be, ultimately I will be successful. And, and I, I identify with that because it's something that I've always had as well. Um, and I noticed that it is, um, noticeably absent um, from quite, from many others. Let's put it that way. And I don't know, um, I don't know uh, how much one that confidence causes the success ultimately, but I, I am confident, like very confident that it impacts the way that you or myself or they work and that not only work, but deal with obstacles and setbacks and overcome challenges. And what I mean by that is that... <laughs> when you operate from a place of certainty and not, you know, like I said, not overconfidence, but certainty that there will be that payoff, then the doubts that might come in on any given project don't, don't tie you up as much or get in the way. In fact, there's a resolve that you get from that certainty to push through challenges that are uh, what others might actually back away from because it's quote unquote, not worth it. But, but the not worth it is because they can't taste that success that is out there maybe at the end of this project maybe not but ultimately will be gotten let me know if that makes any sense whatsoever and if it doesn't ask me a question about it so that maybe i can make it have it make some sense i think it made sense i hope it made sense uh let's page down here uh, ba -ba -ba. all right, cool, 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 cool. Um, I wasn't so sure until recently, but it's becoming more and more obvious. Um, anti fragile. Uh, did you through years develop a way or a system to teach people the intangible parts of certainty? And moving with that knowingness. Great question. I'll go right back to that in a second, Stefan. It's a belief that something is doable. Your email link went to YouTube today. Previously, it went to Facebook. Yeah, well, 
the reason that we didn't send it to Facebook was that when we were mailing, the um, news feed was down. And I don't know if it's up everywhere now, um, but it has been uh, up, obviously, in some places since some of you guys are here. Um, all right. So, no, I haven't. Um, but there's there's also, like... If you were to if you were to kind of hold that idea, right, that way of like moving with that knowingness, right? There's also this is the best word that I can like put to it, even though I would I could see very easily how people could misconstrue the word, but there's a predatory nature to it as well that there's yeah there's a moving with that knowingness like a confidence and dealing with the uncertainty that is reality right um but doing it confidently knowing that you might have to zig and zag but you're gonna hit your outcome at the end of the day right at and that there isn't an overexertion or phonetic type of activity that it's more like a lion that might sleep 23 hours a day and goes after their prey though with a all out intensity uh that is ferocious and focused and purposeful. Um, and so there's this like predator, right? Human beings are predators. If you think that we were designed or evolved to be carnivores, uh, then we're predators. And I think that there's that element of being a predator seizing on the right opportunity for you that has, I don't know, there's, you certainly can see that in uh, wise guys like mafiosos, right? You certainly see that in sociopaths um, and you see it in successful entrepreneurs. Successful entrepreneurs are good at seizing the right opportunities that come across them, right? But only seizing the right ones, which means that they're operating from a very strategic sense. Uh, do, 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 do. All right, so let's keep it going. All right. Hey, Priya, and you changed your photo. Good to see you in Israel. Um, Amit, Rich, what was the biggest lesson to learn from Wes's incredible success in your view? Well, I'll tell you that, like, there's certainly, right, like, you could look at Michael and you could look at Wes, and there certainly is a overall, you could say, fascination with the darker side of life, of prison, of the mafia, etc., and, you know, I guess I take it for granted that um, I've been surrounded by that my whole life. So I find it fascinating, too. Excuse me. But um, I find it fascinating, too, but didn't realize how many people who haven't really ever experienced anything with that life um would think as well so that's news that was that's just interesting to me but i'd also say that um the i could one of the things that both michael and wes i can certainly learn from is uh and Wes did this more before and actually um 
I should I should remind him of this. But um, when I first came across Wes, um, I had never searched for a video about prison. I mean, why would I? <laughs> and um, it just can't, popped up into my feed right on YouTube. And I watched it because it was interesting. And then I watched another one and another one and another one. And I was um, I found it fascinating. And not only did I find it fascinating, but being a marketer and knowing what I know right about YouTube, I also, while I was doing this, was thinking to myself, this is exactly what YouTube wants any video to do, right? I was going to leave the platform, clicked on this video. Now it's a half an hour later, and I'm watching more of this guy's videos. So the, so, and one of the things I realized was about why that was, was that he was telling really interesting stories. I think he's gotten a little bit away from that. Um, however, with Michael, right, I hadn't really watched a lot of Michael's videos. I started to when I was in California because I wanted to have watched a bunch before I met him. And uh, I watched a bunch of them and had it playing, you know, as I was doing other things, working on my slides and stuff like that. And the what was interesting is, is that Tim, who is not, you know, fascinated by the same things that I am, uh, for the most part, uh, she found it really engaging Michael's content and Michael is telling story after story. And it made me realize, and I think I shared this in the last live stream. If I didn't, I don't know where I shared it, but, um, that the, that it made me realize that like more, more often than not, most of the content that I'm posting to YouTube uh, are not videos like that. They're not videos that you would watch one after another after another. If I'm teaching you something or going over something, it's not necessarily the same. It's not as engaging and they're not uh, anywhere near as good. So that's one. But then the other thing that anyone can learn from Wes is discipline and not breaking character and recognizing who it is you need to be right? To have everything that it is that you want and then be that person and not do not deviate from that. And that's obviously a lot easier said than done. Uh, but that's Wes in a nutshell, right? And that strength of purpose, you know, is a powerful, powerful thing. So that would be the first, I'd say, Amit. And uh, may I ask you what sound card you're using? Yeah, I use a, well, I'm not using, I'm using my lab. Well, I'm using a Mac mini um, and there's no sound card in it, but the, I am using an amp, right? By focus, right? And it takes the signal from the mic and then there's a USB-C out that goes in. That is, uh, so maybe if there's a sound card in there, but I, at least the way it's advertised as an amp. Uh, anyway, uh, is that USB mic going straight into your laptop? No, it's going into focus right. Um, and the thing is called what? It's called a Scarlet 2i2 USB because it has uh, two inputs. Uh, I'm curious if you knew Vincent James from the 12 Month Millionaire, and if yes, has he any course out there or what happened to him? Well, he sold the 12 month millionaire. The 12 month millionaire was a like ebook that also came with a swipe file. And uh, Vincent had started a company named Longitude, which was a company that sold pills that supposedly increased. Um, the size of a man's, uh, you know what it is. And, um, and so the, uh, and apparently there's a huge market for it. And, um, and so, uh, it eventually got shut down by the FTC and, um, uh, I think he served time, uh, for it, but I'm not. I don't remember all the particulars of the story. I do not know Vincent, though. I don't know him. 
I'm not even sure if I've ever met him, actually, but I might have, but I'm not sure. But I definitely don't know him. Um, greetings from Quebec, Rich. Cool. Thank you, Brandon. Um, Francie's story is fascinating, how he went through something like 24 months in solitary confinement and came out and reinvented his entire life. It's like the solitary confinement may have actually helped him go through the necessary inner transformation to change. Yeah, it's totally possible. I mean, he's he went through eight months first of diesel therapy, then the solitary. Um, I think he had made up his mind not to change prior to that. Um, and uh, I have numerous friends who have spent time in prison. Um, and one of the things that they all tell me is that uh, how how it teaches you patience um, that you ultimately learn to be extremely patient just because you're often kept waiting most of the time for most things and you have no control over things. Um, so there are certainly things that you can learn um, such as that. But, um, but yeah, diesel therapy, for those of you who don't know what diesel therapy is, diesel therapy is where they book you into a um a different prison pretty much like every day or every other day which means that uh one your family can't get in touch with you because you're always traveling right and uh every time you get booked into a new prison there's a process right strip search anal cavities checked etc um you get issued clothes you have to you know your mattress whatever you have to meet new people and a new bunk mate and whatever. And then the next morning they check you out. You don't know where you're going. They put you on a plane. You're obviously not on a nice, enjoyable plane ride. You're handcuffed the whole time. Um, you have no idea where you're going, how long of a plane ride it is or anything else. And then you're brought to a new jail where you're strip searched again and processed. And then the next morning you're out again and they just keep doing this and they do this to break you, um, when they're trying to get information from you in the, in the federal prison system. And, uh, obviously this can't be done in the state system because there's nowhere to fly to in the, in the federal though they do this. And so they did that to Michael for eight months. Then they put him in solitary for like three years, I think, or two and a half years, um, all in an effort to get him to break, to testify, which he wouldn't do. Um, crazy, right? So what are some common self-sabotaging behaviors of entrepreneurs? Uh, overthinking is probably a big one. Lack of action, uh, right up there with overthinking, uh, not fully grasping that, um, that you always learn more by doing, uh, than by any other method. And that not recognizing, um, Not recognizing red flags with people, employees, customers, etc., cetera, uh, when they first appear. And uh, I'm trying to think. There are probably many more, Romeo, but those are the first ones that occur to me. Priya, it's 2 a.m. and it's my birthday, but I'm here for that sentence, hopefully. A, mo a mob sentence. I mob a sentence copy of you. Um. Well, you shouldn't be here on your birthday. I, there must be better things that you could be doing for you, but um, I'm not sure I understand what you want, but I will try to deliver it if you can clarify. It's another paradoxical thing, the predatorial approach, but you're also going into deals to create win-wins and not really a win-lose like in nature with a predatory prey dynamic. Yeah. Well... Yeah, I'm trying to think, though, like,
there's a difference though between win-win and equality, right? So I spot an opportunity and let's say that we negotiate a deal and it's 90% me, 10% them. If that 10% is more than they would ever experience on their own, um, it's a win for them. It could also be seen as predatory looked at the other way. So it's kind of like, you know, if you're in the information business, you don't set your prices based on the cost to manufacture, right? It's more arbitrary than that. And, um, and yet you're pricing it to maximize income, right? Um, so that's obviously a win for you. Um, might not be the best price for the best, for the most impact or anything else. Right. And so I, I just, I don't want to. And the reason I'm making this point, Stefan, is that like, I do believe in making business fun and I do believe to make a, to set up your business in a way where everyone is rooting for your success. On the other hand, uh, I also was raised by a sociopath that was very successful. And in a response to not be like that, right? Like almost like a, you know, repulsion against that. I went too much the other way, right? Like too nice of a guy at times. And so I don't want to, I don't want to propagate a wrong belief that, you know, you as the entrepreneur are always trying to be um, the absolute most fair to everyone else. You're trying to be fair to everyone, but fair or better than fair. But that doesn't preclude you from benefiting even more than that. And, and, and I qualify all this by saying that I I'm saying all this so that, you know, you don't make the mistake of, of giving away too much as an entrepreneur, I guess. And I'm not saying that you would Stefan, but I'm saying that in general, I think entrepreneurs make that mistake, giving up too much equity too early, things like that. Heard that story, so yeah, I heard that too, Ned. Um, I call it walking by faith and trusting. It's a spiritual thing. That's how I see it. I can't understand how a mafia guy can be like that, though. Well, there's like, haven't you ever seen, like, even in movies, right? Like when a good actor is playing someone who is got who's got that background, they generally walk with a swagger, with a sense of confidence. Do you know what I'm talking about or no? Rich, who is Michael? Part of my ignorance. Um, I talked about him at the very beginning. Uh, he's a former member of the Colombo crime family and a very no very well known uh, member of the mafia who was the top earner for the mafia and a bunch of other stuff uh mobsters fighters warriors are used to navigating chaos true legit beasts that's why everyone in the world both men and women are fascinated by those characters vito corleone joker tyler durden hannibal Lecter. Loki, etc. Do you think it's that it's the navigating of chaos, Stefan? That's an interesting thought. Hmm. Interesting. Very interesting. Hello, Deb. Uh, do, 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 do. Where, uh, where am I? There we are. Uh, how do you make your background multicolored like that? Uh, different lights. Different lights. I have <laughs> green lights on that side, and I have 
red and blue lights on this side. And there's a wall in between, right? You guys see that. So that's how I do that. Um, watching from Sharjah in United Arab Emirates. Wow. Nice to meet you. Uh, con Consolia. How do I pronounce that? Consolius? Consolacion? Colossian? Consolus? Yeah. Can you write that out phonetically? Uh, Mr. Rich, how are you, sir? Hope all is well. Please advise on the mastermind of Miami. If there are any updates, etc. Thank you. You're the goat shared to my group. Thanks, John. Um, I have the dates. I think I wrote them down, didn't I? I did not. It's, I think it's May 23rd, 24th, 25th or something like that, but um, I'll have more details. I actually have to record a video for that. And win when each person is winning something different. All right. Well, as long as someone's, as long as it's not equal, then yes, win win. My question I am the only woman in human history who created a new to the art history painting expression, save like Van Gogh. That's my past record. My newly soon to be launched e store promotes a new line of products, also a new stream in art, what I call neoclassical pop art. Okay, selling art, fashion, and design, artistic goodies, and prices to meet demands of both an art enthusiast, tight on budget, and high-end collectors. I want to convey in one sentence that will run on top of the site. Okay. Well, what have you come up with so far? What's the best idea that you've come up with so far? And then we will crowdsource and see what we can all do as a group. Um, how are your YouTube videos? Are you feeling more at ease with it? Um, no, not really. Um, I got to record one next week, but the one since we're going to release the Michael Francis video, um, we're not, we don't need to record one tonight. I already figured its components, the who and why, it's really much more of a copy smart now. That means phrasing the sentence so it gives both collectors and buyers confidence and sounds friendly and appealing. Agreed. But what have you got so that we can look at the component pieces? I mean, something, not some. Okay. What are your thoughts on partnership with senior businessman with younger new laptop marketers? All for it, Cornell, if the... A uh, senior businessman has wisdom and knowledge and success in their past to share. Yes. I don't know what the question was, Emmy. Uh, right. I get that subtly, that subtlety you're pointing at between being too nice in business and being just fair enough to not be an asshole, a.k.a. playing to win. Yeah, and that's what I'm talking about, right? Like, there have certainly been times where I've been negotiating against myself for the benefit of someone else that in hindsight, I probably should have, it wouldn't, had it been the other way around, it would have not have been, uh, it would not have been the same at all and uh, probably was unnecessary. Uh, I know what you're talking about. Got it. All right. It's blurred. Okay. What are the common mistakes entrepreneurs make when they negotiate? Um, well, the first thing they, the first mistake they make is thinking that they're not going to, right? Because if you say that you don't like to negotiate, all you're doing is just giving up your power and therefore um, <laughs> locking in the highest price, which doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, the... Impulsivity is certainly a mistake when negotiating. Um, letting your ego get in the way. Um, in other words, not being willing to claim poverty or to make the other person feel like the price point is expensive by reacting to it, um, by agreeing to things too early and therefore giving the appearance that 
um, it wasn't a good deal for the other side, right? Um, and everyone gets that, right? Like in negotiation, um, think about something relatively worthless, right? Like this isn't particularly worthless because someone gave me this, um, but um, actually the um, it was an actor that gave me this and it was the guy that played uh, the police no, the, was he the police officer or the bounty hunter and uh, Jackie Brown? But anyway, um, let's say this was worthless, right? And um, I said uh, to you, like, will you pay me $100 for this? And someone else immediately, like right next to you, was like, I will. And quickly gave me the money. You would be like, hmm, like, what was that about? Like, did I just miss something? Or like, if someone agrees to your price point really fast, it gives the impression that maybe you mispriced, right? Um, so agreeing too early in a negotiation, um, you might just be being fair, but you've given the indication that actually they could have gotten more from you. Um, so there are a lot of mistakes that people make. Not listening. Uh, that's probably the biggest one, I'd say, because you have to hear the other side and what they truly want to make the best negotiation. Uh, yes, it's definitely the way they navigate chaos. I have a whole philosophy on this. Got a bunch of it from one of my mentors, Arash de Bazaar. It's the ability to handle chaos that is so attractive. They're comfortable in chaos. <laughs> Stefan, I want to hear more about this. Um, message me or something, but I want to hear more about this. Um, Rich, when you've talked about writing and getting royalties, what are some of the easier ways to set that up for a copywriter? Or is that what you're talking about, Christy? Um, is that, I mean, it's a copywriting thing. Or are you talking about like my licensing deals, like our licensees in Italy and Japan and Brazil and stuff like that? Machiavellian life is wild. Yes, I'd say so. Both men and women are fascinated by that. People like that bring certainty. Ah, yes. They do do that, don't they? They do do that. Your art, is it like an NFT? Yeah, that's where everyone's going, Priya. Any tips on reducing the problem of shopping cart abandonment? Um, I have lots of stuff on shopping cart abandonment. I don't know that now's the time, Romeo, but um, yes, I do. I do. Um, that sounds like a good topic for one of these live streams. Um, created by only women in art history to invent new painting method, your ROI guaranteed, can't really crack it, and I'm normally okay. That's not you, Priya, right? Because before it was... Right, I don't think that's you. Um, you can't really tell that it's a wall dividing the colors, therefore it appears blurry. Oh, well, I guess that's cool, right? Copywriting. Um, well, I don't have any great answers for you, Christy. I mean, it's about being at the top of your game and getting the top, um, working for a top company that recognizes how vital copywriting is so if you're working at any of the financial newsletters just got your text stefan so we'll talk um if you know in the financial newsletter market um it's not only the agoras of the world that pay royalties and they'll pay anywhere from a dollar to five dollars per new customer acquired like on a front end and anywhere from one percent to five percent of back end sales, which can be millions, right? Um, so, uh, but Agora is certainly not the only one. Pretty much all financial newsletters do. And I would say that in any area of direct response where companies have grown to a sizable size, um, that's where you have the opportunity to get royalties um, because you also will be competing with the world's best copywriters. And the 
you know, it's like Clayton Makepeace, right? He would get paid 25000 to write a sales letter, but he wasn't writing it for the 25000 He was writing it to write a control that could make him millions if it outproduced everyone else. Does the Evergreen Project ma Management Quality Analysis what uh, values play with this new email customer service model? Cornell, I have no idea what you're talking about. Rich, are you familiar with conversion AI? If so, what do you think about it? Do you think it poses a threat to copywriters? Right now, it serves as a help to copywriters. I've only heard good things about it from copywriters, um, but don't know if it will ever take the place of, and actually I'm supposed to talk to the founder of it and uh, just hasn't happened yet. But I think we have a call scheduled and I'm excited about it because I've heard such good things about it. Helping entrepreneurs with mindset and technicalities regarding doing sales. Would you say that's a good niche? I did that with two entrepreneurs, got them great results, but all those things were common sense to me since I've been doing sales calls and door to door and generally just studying sales and pickup for years. Um, it could be a good niche, but who do you think ultimately Stefan would be the, like, who's the buyer? What kind of entrepreneur, right? Uh, what are they doing? Tell me that if you can. And, um, hmm. I'm really bummed about this, uh, not being able to play this Francisi video for you guys. I'm just going to see if you get, yeah, I'm sure you're not, but let's see if, can I, is there a way to, oh, maybe I could share screen. That could work. If I share screen, oh, share video file, hot diggity dog, guys. I can play the Michael Francisi video. So I think we should play that. What do you guys think? You guys is down with that? And then we'll wrap up when it's over. I'll be in the chat. So we can certainly still chat. Let's play this bad boy and see if it works. Let me know if you can hear it or you can't hear it. A guy by the name of Vinny who was a butcher around me. He used to bring me my meat. He was a big guy, you know, a scary looking guy. So he comes in, he's carrying a box mm -hmm. on his shoulder. And I said, Vinny, what are we having a party here? You know, what, what's with all the meat? He says, it ain't meat, Chief. He puts the box down, opens it up. He says, this is the first week's take in the gas business. It was $320,000. The first week. From 1979 to 1985, we grew that into uh, 8 to $10 million a week. Hi, I'm Richard Sheffrin, and I'm from Strategic Profits, and today we have a really special guest, Michael Francis. He is the only gentleman who was able to leave the Mafia without ratting or dying, basically, and also the uh, largest earner in Mafia history, as uh, many press and uh, different programs have anointed him based on the gasoline tax evasion that he did, uh, when was it? It was back in the late 70s, early 80s. Late 70s, early 80s. So we're here, just luck would have it, talking about different things. And I asked Michael if he would be willing to just hop on camera for 15 or 20 minutes and kind of talk about the lessons of the mafia and how they could be applied to entrepreneurship. And so we've had, we were talking a little bit off air about just how people carry themselves, mm -hmm. uh, the difference between an earner and a thug, like, you know, in your, you know, in your past life. And so without even maybe asking you a question to start, why don't you take like a couple of minutes just to talk about what your experience is like as far as people who came into the mafia and really thrived as an earner versus maybe those who didn't and what you saw as the differences between the types. Yeah, and, and like you said, there were, you know, I'll give you an example in the Colombo family, which I was a part of. We had 115 made guys, guys that actually took the oath. We had a lot of associates who weren't taking the oath, but they were around. And out of that 115, I think there were 20 of us that were really earners. And the others were, you know, just guys that were doing the work, you know, right. no-show job, whatever. They didn't really have the ability to, to, uh, to earn money. And the reason for that is, what I noticed, the guys that were earning, 
they had that ability to begin with. They carried themselves that way. They just learned how to use that life to benefit them in business. And I think that's where I, you know, had an advantage too. I knew how to use that life to benefit me in business and as a result went on to make a, a significant amount of money. But it's, it's in you already. It's just like learning to know your environment or the tools that you have and be able to put them to work and benefit you in business. And when you say that there was a way of like sizing up a deal that was unique to the Mafia or not really? No, I wouldn't think so. I mean, obviously, you know, we did things with the union that, right. we, you know, because we had a lot of control in the union, so we knew how to use that union, you know, when we had to deal with contractors and give them sweetheart deals and so on and so forth. But even there, you had to be able to talk to the contractor the right way. You had to be able to use the union in the right way so that it made sense for them and it also benefited us. And, you know, you can't just go in and bully your way in because that doesn't always work, you know. My thing, Rich, and what I noticed from a lot of the people that were successful in that life, they tried to make friends rather than enemies of the people that they were dealing with. Uh, and in that life especially, because you know you are who you are, you want to make as many friends as you possibly can, and uh, even in the business world. And was there a way to kind of, you said something when we were talking off air about like when you owned bars or clubs that you had to have like a bouncer, but the purpose right. of a bouncer wasn't really to beat people up, it was to make sure that nobody got beat up so that, you know, like people would be afraid to act out as opposed to want to interact with the bouncer, right? And I would imagine that there's a lot of that as it relates to the mafia, like it's more about strength and not having to use it, right, than it is about actually, because when you use your strength, now you might get in trouble, like, you know, you're exposed as opposed to just the threat or the mystery of what's behind you. Exactly. You know, and two examples of that, again, with the bouncer, we used to get the bouncers that looked the part. They were big, you know, they were strong, and they carried themselves the right way. And I would tell them, I hired you because of what you look like. If you have to go in and start beating people up and causing a ruckus in my club every night, I don't need you. It's your presence that's supposed to count. You know, I'll give you an example. We had, um, I had a, uh, an agent around me that uh, at one time represented all the big black talent from Marvin Gaye to Dionne Warwick to everybody. And uh, we actually were going to have the Michael Jackson Victory Tour in 1984. And uh, he had, Michael's um, agent didn't want to go along with it. Okay. So he had asked me to go out to California to see him, down to LA. So I went out there and he knew who I was walking in the door. I didn't have to go out there and threaten him and say, you're gonna do this right. or else. You know, it was implied, you know who I was, and basically I said to him, look, there's gonna be an advantage of you working with us. It'd be a disadvantage if you don't. You know, so you, you understand what I'm saying. Let's try to work this out the right way. You know, rather than walking in the door and, you know, putting my weight around, he knew who I was, so I didn't have to do that. And, um, you know, for me, it was always a better way to work, and, and the guys that I saw that were business guys in that life, they acted the same way. And was it as simple as like spotting an opportunity or were there kinds of opportunities that you most like to look for like in your earning days in the mom? You know, I mean, because of who I was and, I, you know, I was kind of the go-to guy on Long Island at the time, I would always have people coming to me with different deals. And to a point where I actually had a, a bar, I called it, uh, it was Michael's actually. I, I bought it, it wasn't named after me, I bought it, it just happened to be Michael's. But I said, if you wanted to propose something to me, every Monday night I'll be in that place and come and we had a back room and you'd sit and talk. And I think what I learned throughout is I learned how to um, uh, see what a good deal was and separate it from something that didn't make sense. And that just, you know, I guess it was just experience that, that uh, you know, that uh, I developed that talent or whatever you want to call it. But um, I think you have to be able to recognize you know, according to the times and everything that's going on, what a good deal is. And it wasn't because I was a mob guy, I was right. a business guy also, right. you know. But obviously if I thought, if it was something in the gambling business and I thought, well, you know what I mean, this could be helpful because this is what I do on the street, well then yeah, I mean, I, I might have been drawn to that. And would you say that it was, like in private equity, they talk about funding the team more than the idea, that the, the idea might change, but if you have the right team, they'll know when to change it in order to be successful. Yes. So they invest more in the people than they are in the idea. 
would you say it was the same or would you say it was actually more the opposite like it was this no I, I would definitely say that you know um, I, I am not one that believes in micromanaging not at all as a matter of fact if I did that I'd be a total failure because there's a lot of things that I don't do well and I don't want to do them but I always my, my motto was always be Michael do what you do best delegate the rest and what I did is I found the right people I treated them well and I managed them well and they're the ones that built the business you know I mean I did my part you know whatever it might be I recognized I said this is gonna work I just gotta have the right team I took good care of them and I managed them properly and I think that's the key to almost any business yeah I would agree that that's that is the primary key what would you say that you did best what was your wheelhouse I knew how to select a good you know opportunity when it came and I knew how to get the most out of the people that was it you know I got them to work for me I motivated them they were happy they wanted to do the job they wanted to make me proud and that's something you know you got to treat people the right way and is that both in your businesses and then also like in your crew yeah same way in the crew look in that life if you don't make them earn money right you know people turn on you quick but I give you an example I had somebody around me his name was Frankie and uh, he was in bad shape and I, I liked him a lot and I said Frankie come here I was in the gas business I said I'm going to give you a job. I want you to go around to all the gas stations and collect money. They're going to give you a bag. Just collect the cash. Easy. I'm going to pay you $1,500 a week. That was back in 1981. It's a lot of money. money. So he did it. He was happy. Loved, you know, the best thing ever happened to him. Well, about four months later, he comes and asks me for a raise. <laughs> I said, a raise? Do you think you're worth $1,500 a week? But what happened was he started to look at my money. Right. And then it got into his head. So that taught me there's got to be a balance. You got to tell them. You got to set things straight right up front with people. You know, you're in, you're not indispensable. I'm doing this for you as a favor. I like you. You're going to earn it. Don't get me wrong. It's not you know you're going to earn your money, but just make sure you appreciate what you got. Yeah. So and and I've I've learned that along the way with a lot of people. Yeah, I've learned that. Uh kind of making sure that whenever you go above and beyond you let people know that you're going above and beyond yes. and you haven't reset like for new expectations the you know when I with the entrepreneurs I deal with a lot of them it's a transition process when I'm involved with them from them being the sole person that's responsible for generating profit to spreading out that responsibility to more members of the team that you know as you have a small business you know as you have more people who are actually responsible for generating profit it it eases the pressure on the entrepreneur and the business can grow a lot more and in a way like it's almost similar I, I don't know if it is I'm asking um, is that like the difference between when you're a soldier versus a capo like more of the stuff that you're actually earning is through other people doing the work like versus you kind of one step removed now and you have a group of people that well let me tell you that would be more the boss okay okay when you're a couple like I was you're almost responsible for having your guys earn on the street because most of them are not going to be earning Got it. And so you're trying to take care of them but you know they always had to put whatever they were doing on record with me there was times I'd tell them I don't want you doing that it's not worth it they'd come to me for advice but basically I was making them earn when it comes to the boss it's different you're paying up to him right you know your, your cop regime as I was paid up to the boss you know when I when I first got into the, uh, the uh, gasoline business and I realized what I had. I went to see my boss, who was Persico at the time, and I said, look, I called him Junior. I said, Junior, I'm going to show you more money than you've ever seen, ever. I don't care what anybody else is doing. And he looked at me immediately and said, we don't do drugs. I said, it's not drugs. I hate anything to do with drugs. He said, what is it? I said, it's gas. He said, what do you mean? I said, it's tax money. I found a way to defraud the government out of tax. I said, but it's going to be a very involved scheme. I'm going to have a lot to put together. I said, but it's going to be a lot of money. I said, but here's what you need to do for me. I said, you cannot get anybody else involved. Right. As soon as it gets on the street, everybody's going to want a piece because it's going to be a lot of money. I said, I have to win every argument. Every time we sit down, you got to make me win. I said, don't play politics with the other family. I said, I'm not telling you what to do. You're mm. my boss. Right. But I'm telling you, uh, how are you going to earn? He looked at me. He said, prove it to me. I said, you got it. And I did. Yeah. I never lost an argument. You know, so what did he do? He just managed me to make sure that, you know, the golden goose gives kept right. producing. So that's what happens at that level.
It's not so much their involvement. Unless you're like Paul Castellano, who was, he was a business guy. He was very involved in, in some of his business, the chicken business, right. for instance. But I don't know how deep, you know, how involved he was, but I heard he was pretty involved. But most of the time, you're just paying up. And when you were running the gas business, you still had your crew, right? Yes. So that was like a second job almost. Yeah. Right? Well, I put everybody in the bed. I gave everybody a gas station. Got That's it. how you're going to earn money. You got a station. And we had over 350 gas stations we either owned or leased at, at that time. And is there an easy way to describe how you were able to bypass the tax? You know, it was, it was <clears throat> an easy way. It was a lot of accounting involved. Right. You know, so I had accountants on the payroll that I trusted. Um, and basically, we had to create a scheme that made it very hard for the government to figure out what we were doing. And basically, I had 18 companies that were licensed to collect the tax on every gallon of gasoline. And we had an, interest, inter, an intricate scheme around every one of those companies that would give me about 10 to 12 months before the government would come down on us right. and say, hey, where's the tax money? By that time, we just closed shop, moved on to the next license. That's how we were doing it. But, you know, they would, they would um, audit and monitor you along the way, and we right. had to be able to put obstacles up so that they, they couldn't get us. Wow. And um, what, how quickly did it scale up? Like, did it scale up pretty quickly once you started, or was Very, it like... No, it, it um, well, when the, when the guy came to me with this idea, so here's another thing, Rich. People think they, they're under the impression that mob guys sit in their social clubs <laughs> and they devise all these intricate schemes how to defraud right. a company. 99% of the time, it's not like that. Somebody from their company would come to us and say, hey, I got a scheme, I need your help. Okay, they figure we'll finance them, we'll right. protect them, we're not going to snitch on them. And that's what happened here. So a guy comes to me with a germ of an idea. And, you know, without getting into all the detail, I said, all right, we're in business together. I said, but I don't want to use your company. I don't know if you owe taxes or whatever. We're going to form a new company. Clean. So I put somebody with this guy. I had, I had a guy by the name of Vinny who was a butcher around me. He used to bring me my meat. He was a big guy, you know, a scary-looking guy. And I said, I want you to stay with this guy for two weeks and see what we got. Two weeks, he comes to my house. And um, every Saturday, he would bring me meat. He was a butcher. So he comes in, he's carrying a box mm. on his shoulder. And I said, Vinny, what are we having a party here? Mm. You know, what, what's with all the meat? He says, it ain't meat, Chief. He said, come in the kitchen, I want to show you something. We go in the kitchen. Mm. He puts the box down, opens it up. He says, this is the first week's take in the gas business. <laughs> was $320,000. The first week. Wow. Over a period of, from 1979 to 1985, we grew that into uh, 8 to $10 million a week. So it, it, it went up pretty quick. Once I understood what we had, then it was just a question of expanding it. And how do you, I know that your partner eventually like turned and that's what got you caught, but how long do you think you would have kept going if he didn't turn? Uh, I, I think it would have been very difficult. I had two agents come to me at my dealership and they said, Francis, we need to talk to you. And we walked, two FBI agents, and we walked outside and they said, look, we know what you're doing. Okay, this word, we, we understand that you're doing something to defraud the government, but we don't know what. These are two agents. They said, just tell us, and we'll give you a pass. I said, what are you talking about? I said, if you want to buy a car, I'll sell you a car. You know, I wanted that. They got so mad at me, Richard. You're not going to tell us. We're going to, you're going to go to jail for it. I said, I don't know what you're talking about. I said, you know, come on. I said, I got a couple of gas stations. They're earning money. Don't worry about it. And that was it. They could not figure it out. Wow. I don't, I don't know. If, if he didn't turn informant, we probably would have had another couple of years because we were always devising new ways. Like at one point in time, I bought a terminal from British Petroleum in, uh, in Oceanside, Long okay. Island, and we were storing so much gasoline in there, and that was another way without getting into the detail because people ask me all the right. time, Michael, just tell us the scheme. You <laughs> can't do that. Um, reform. Yeah. But um, that was another way to hold the government off. It was just another accounting issue right. that they couldn't figure out. So we were always one step ahead of them. Interesting. And what was the, so we all know that the gas was like your number one thing. What was the second thing? What was the like second industry that you were in that spurred the most cash to you? I made a lot of money in the car business. Car business? Yeah, I made it. Because back then too, um, you know, we were on recourse with a lot of dealers. Right. Where we were able to, I get anybody financed because we were on recourse. Can't do that now with the financing paper. So I put everybody in a car and we never got stiffed. 
I mean, I, you know, there were certain cars when I saw somebody, I would tell them, look, I'm going to get an extra set of keys. You're going to pay me weekly. If you don't pay me on, uh, the, it's due Monday, and you don't pay me Tuesday, the car's gone. That's it. No matter what you paid, it's lost. We never got stiffed on a car. So I was putting everybody, and we were selling more cars. I mean, I won more sales contests than you can imagine. We were just selling cars like crazy. And that was a lucrative business. Service was great, and I loved it. I mean, I loved what we were doing. Then I got into leasing, and we were leasing a lot of cars. So made a lot of money with those two agencies and a leasing company that I had. And, and then I was in the film business. And um, for about, this was early on in the business when we were, we were making movies and I made probably about, I think 45 or 50 films. Oh, wow. And at the time we had an output deal with Vestron Video. Okay. And that output deal and us bicycling 200 to 250 prints around the country at that time, we were able to make a lot of money would be movies. I mean, they were like all horror films. Exploitation films were big in the early 80s. And so we kind of saw that niche at that time, and, and we were making a lot of money. Putting these little films together cost us nothing, and they're just bicycling them around the country, output deal with Vestron. We'd, pro we'd get just about all our money back just from the video end of it. Wow. Yeah. And so would you say that, I mean, obviously the gas thing, you had to be connected and in the mob for that, right? Yes. But the stuff that you did in the car dealership and in the movie business? Legit. The only thing illegit about the movie business, I was financing with gasoline. Money. Right, yes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. And would you say, like, what would you say are the biggest lessons that you took, you know, because now, you you know, you've reformed and now you've got a franchise called Slices and you're doing lots of other things. Like, what were some of the biggest lessons that you took from the mob uh, to your, like, now everyday life as far as business goes? You know, business is business, Rich, no matter what. Even if you're doing it illegally, you got to do it right or you're going to lose money. You know, in the gas business, if we didn't do it right, we were going to lose. If you're a bookmaker, if you're not laying off some of the big bets, you can get killed on a right. weekend. you got to know what your level is. So no matter what you're doing, it's still business. you got to do it right. So, I mean, I, that's just something I learned, and I applied that same principle to what I'm doing now. You know, just got to do it right. One thing I always tell people, I used to have people come to me and they said, you know, Michael, I want to open up a restaurant. Right. I said, okay. What's your plan? Well, I'm going to make good food. <laughs> I said, okay, well, that's kind of obvious. What else is your plan? Well, I'm going to get a good location. Mm -hmm. Okay. But what's your plan, All right. right? So they wouldn't have one. They had no idea. They had no idea whatsoever. So what I used to tell people all the time, what I did for myself is, you got to give yourself a written plan. Write it down. Explore it talk to people, have your consigliere input in it, write it down. And so when you're going in, this is your model. This is it. Now, there's times you're going to deviate. You need flexibility, market changes here and there, but that's your plan and you stick to it going in and make sure it's a good one before you go in. So many people I know don't do that, Rich. Really? They don't. They don't. They just go in, oh, I'm going to open up a restaurant, I have good food. Somebody tells me there's no other restaurant here. I'm <laughs> going to be the only one. I said, well, why would you want to do that? Yeah. Unless you want to open up a restaurant where there's a lot of restaurants, where a lot of people coming down. You got good food, they'll come here, they'll go there. Restaurant row. Yeah. Some people think they don't want the, they, yeah, like they don't want the competition. They want to be scared of. It's wrong. And when we were talking offline, also you said something, and it's, it's very much in line with the way I think. Um, you know, when I design a business, my goal is to try and figure out a way that everybody wins. Everyone wants that yes. business to win. That the customers feel like it's a it's the business they want to do business with. The vendors want to do business with this business, so that everyone's rooting for this business to win, as opposed to just the owner. And like we should all root mm -hmm. for this business to make a lot of money for the owner. Um, and you said something similar to that when we were talking off air about. Um, I'm not sure which business it was that we were talking about, but that you wanted to make sure that they had a win. Do you remember what we were talking about? Mm, no, but I, I'll give you another example. We opened up, you know, I have this pizza franchise right. now. So there's a store across the street uh, from us, and uh, about a week before we opened, I went in there because a couple of weeks before that, the owner of that business threw my partner out, called him a spy, threw him out <laughs> of the place, and all right. So, I went in there, I wanted to see the menu. Right. They didn't know who I was. At least I didn't think so. Uh. I walk in the door, and the guy sitting behind the counter looks at me like this. I said, oh man, he must storm with that guy's right. partner. He looks at me, and he looks at his phone, and mm. he says, 
Michael Francis, I'm looking at you on YouTube right now. Right? So he said, I'm your biggest fan. And he, he runs out with a pizza box. And he said, will you autograph the pizza box? Now I don't have the heart to tell him that that's my place across the street. Right. right. I said, so we talk and talk and talk and I leave. So um, I went back to him afterwards and I said, look, I don't want to be deceitful. We're in the same community two blocks away. Right. We serve a different kind of pizza. I said, when anybody wants a round pizza, I'm going to send them to you. I said, you know, we, we all got to make money. Right. Here. Nobody's trying. Well, my partner wants to put him out of business. <laughs> I said, we can't do that, you know. This is one community, you know. But, um, you know, look, you're not there to try to put somebody out of business. Right. You're not, you know what I mean? You want people to earn money. And I always found it a better way. That's just, that's just my way. Yeah, I agree. And it's Sicilian pizza. Or at least that's it's, what we call it, like, when we see square... It's, it's Sicilian in, in shape only. Oh, in shape only. But the uh, the dough is very light and airy versus Sicilian, which is kind of yeah. heavy. You know, it's thick. It's actually a Roman style pizza. Ah, yeah, yeah we've had that. Yeah, it's the, Roman style. And so, as this, I don't want to take too much of your time. So I wanted to ask one last question, just about any advice that anything that I didn't ask you that maybe I should have asked you that relates to being an entrepreneur. I, I explained to you like the entrepreneurs that I'm speaking to mostly have gotten past like the startup stage. They're generally somewhere between a half a million and 20 million, somewhere in there. Um, and I just, I imagine that a lot of things, it sounds like you had a really strong father. I had a really strong father. I learned a lot in his shadow as he did his business deals. I kind of just watched and learned as a child. And I noticed that a lot of my clients don't have that experience. They don't have that knowledge. And so their parents were working nine to five and so they don't, they haven't really grasped this idea that, you know, it's your business, you make the rules, that you can really kind of determine what the right spot for you, like by leveraging your strengths, making your weaknesses kind of irrelevant in whatever situation you kind of design for yourself. And I just would imagine that you've seen so many people do so many things over the years. Um, some work out, some don't. Um, just any words of wisdom to someone who is trying to make their way online in this in today's world? Well, you know, my dad did teach me a lot, but he taught me less in business because I don't think he was a great business guy. Right. My my dad, my dad's theory was always other people's money. He never wanted to invest in anything. That was my real clash with him because I said, Dad, you got to put up money to make money at times, you know. But he was old school in that thinking, so we used to we used to clash in that way. But but it, he always gave in. But um, you know, he taught me how to navigate that life very well, and as a result, I was able to take what he taught me in that life and apply it to the real world life experiences. You know, one, one of the things I think is so important is just learning how to deal with people. You know, people ask me all the time about my negotiating skills because in that life, you're always negotiating. If you're an active guy, like I was, you're always in a sit down, you're always negotiating, whether it be business or maybe somebody's life situation. I mean, it's always a negotiation. You gotta know how to read people you got to have a plan B. You're not always going to win. you got to know what you're going to settle for. And I, again, I always found it always to try to come out of a negotiation, you know, with people saying, okay, it was fair for both of us. And there's sometimes when I had to make people think they won right. because of their ego, but I knew I got what I wanted in the end. So I think in business, you know, and I tell people, your whole life is a negotiation, yeah. you know. Look, I'm married, I negotiate <laughs> with my wife, my kids, I mean, my next door neighbor, you're negotiating all the time. How do you read people, and how in turn um, does that benefit you in your business that you're in? And I think it's so important to be uh, an expert in reading people. Yeah. You don't have to be a psychiatrist, you don't have to be a, you know, a therapist, you're gonna have to read the people that you're dealing with. Yeah, no doubt. And would you say that um, you got better and better with that over time? Or were you always good at it? Well, I know I, I definitely got better in it. You know, in that life, you're forced to get better if you're going to be very active. So because there's certain techniques in that life, believe it or not, in dealing with people that, you know, if you're in a sit down and you make a mistake in what you say, you lose an argument whether you're right or wrong. So you really had to be, you had to weigh your words very carefully. You had to know how to outmaneuver somebody. You couldn't let, I was a younger guy, you couldn't let the old timers put you in a trap, you know. And I found that very, very helpful in negotiating other deals, even with Phil. Look, I had a, I had a deal um, with Ned Tannen 
who was ahead of Paramount at one time. I don't know if you know that name. And he and I were sitting down. I said, you know, I'm fooling with these small films and I'm making money. I said, I want to get into the big time with you. He said, how much you got? I said, how much you want? You know, he looked at me and he said, for real? I said, yeah, for real. I said, but on my terms. I right. said, how much do you want? He said, well, I need 10 million. I said, you got it. I said, write the deal now. So he writes it on a napkin. Right. You know, like the whole Hollywood <laughs> right. thing. You know, and then I went to jail after that. But I, thank God I probably would have lost all the money. It probably would have been a dumb deal at the end of it. But, you know, I knew what Ned wanted at that time. And I think, I think had I had the opportunity, I probably would have been a part of that studio. Wow. You know, yeah, I really mean that, but it didn't work out because I had, I had legal troubles at the time. But um, read people. Just learn how to deal with them. I, um, I've been watching a lot of your videos, and in watching your videos, I was reminded of my dad in two different places, not specifically, but just the stories that you told reminded me of stuff. One was right before he passed away, he sat down with me and he said, uh, when I sit down with someone, I'm trying to figure out how to get all the money that's in their pocket into my pocket. You don't seem like that type. And I'm like, no, Dad, I'm not mm -hmm. that type. But uh, I heard you say that about somebody. Well, no, yeah. that's what your dad said to you. Yeah, but my okay. dad said that about himself, that he yes. is that. And right. he didn't see that killer instinct in me. Well, let me tell you the difference in the mob. Yeah. The mob guys believe that all the money in your pocket really belongs to us. <laughs> and we just have to figure out how to get it out of here. Yeah, so, so he know? didn't think it belonged to him, but he wanted it to belong well, no, to him. Well, no, mob guys think it really belongs to us. <laughs> and then this, At least they did. This one, like, uh, Kim knows this because... Uh, She's heard this story before, but my dad used to, uh, I used to do a lot of things wrong as a kid. And uh, we have that in common. Yeah. And my dad would, uh, when my dad found out something, he wouldn't tell me. He'd bring me into his home office and he'd say, uh, okay, here's the deal. Like, I heard something. And uh, if I have to tell you what I heard, the punishment is this. If you tell me what, the pu what you did, the punishment's like one quarter of that. Right. But I was doing so many things wrong all the time that I could never... <laughs> <laughs> you know what to tell him. Yeah, I didn't know what to tell him, so I always had to look at him and be like, I have no idea, Dad, what you're talking about. Because you want to tell him something yeah, good. The, that would have been a second strike. Yeah, but uh, <laughs> it seemed like something that... Uh, my dad wasn't in the mafia or anything, but sounds like a mafia kind of question to ask yeah. their kid. Um, yeah. Well, this has been great. I appreciate you taking the time. Uh, big fan of your work, and I know that you're just going to... like. Based on what I've seen in the last seven months on YouTube, uh, I imagine you're going to be all over the place real shortly. You'll be on Rogan. You'll be all over. So uh, we're trying. Yeah, it's, it's, a new, uh, it's a new territory for me. But well, you'll so master this like all the other ones, I'm sure. So thank you. Best of luck. Thank you. Hey, all right, so we're back, and um, let's see. Uh, ba -ba -ba. Sorry, guys, I was just texting with, uh, um, I don't know what OP was saying. Uh, no, you didn't miss much asthma. It's not too late. Um, all right, let's see. The one in the other neighborhood pizza to be successful too is very cool. Buying pizza from one place doesn't mean you won't buy pizza from another place. I've been working on making video games and find that the community of indie developers is all very supportive of each other. Customers buy lots of games. So buying one game doesn't mean a customer won't buy others. Totally agree. And also really like uh, Michael's pizza is Roman style. So if you've ever been to Rome, the pizza really is very much, it looks like Sicilian, tastes like Roman. It is very different than your standard pizza. And uh, so, yeah, I could totally see them both being successful. And it's recognizing that, you know, um, not to be scarcity minded. I would also say uh, to Priya, um, and hold on, I'm just going to text my friend here and say, let's discuss it tomorrow. Um, let's see. Um, and yeah, um, someone asked, oh, Ned asked if slices was good. And I said, it's very good. And I'm not just saying that because you kill me, but, uh, I'm saying that because it's true. And, um, the Damon asked a question about, uh, 
Napoleon Hill and that he had a shady past and that the alleged encounter with Andrew Carnegie never took place. I uh, was wondering what I think about it. I believe that that is the truth, that actually he never met Andrew Carnegie. Andrew Carnegie did not give him three seconds to make up his mind and to decide. I think that's all copy talk. And it sounds like a great story, but like every great story I've ever heard, I thought it was bullshit. Doesn't negate the power of the book. Also doesn't negate the power of the book, the fact that Napoleon Hill died bankrupt. Uh, a lot of people don't know that either. But um, yeah, I would say, Damon, that uh, I believe that that's true, that he never met him, all made up. Doesn't mean it's not a great book, though. Um, and I, it is a great book, but I do believe it's all bullshit, personally. Uh, um, hopefully that doesn't bother you guys, but that's, that's at least what I believe. Um, let's see here. All right. Um, all right. Let's see. Oh, cool. I'm glad you guys liked it. Okay. Um, that was awesome. Glad you liked it, man. Very insightful video. Thanks for sharing. I'm glad you guys liked it. Michael Francis, F-R-A-N-Z-E-S-E. -E. Um, if you like that interview, I think you would love his channel and you will love um, the stories that he tells because basically he's telling lots of stories. And uh, he's a great storyteller, as you can tell. Thanks, Miboso. Thanks, Ned. Uh, have you read the book, No More Mr. Nice Guy? Yes, I did. I did read it. And it's still a challenge for me uh, in many ways, right? Like, because I really am so fearful to not be the way my dad was that, yeah, there's an overcompensation for sure. Uh, Entrepreneur 101 in 20 minutes. Uh, thanks, Susita. Uh, I think it could be interesting for you. It, it was, and uh, I still have my notes on it. I should review it. Do you care to share what your dad's line of business was? Well, my dad was in a lot of different businesses. He was in the used clothing business. That was his primary job um, or his primary business. But he really was a hustler. Like, he hustled. He made, he bought stuff, sold stuff. Um, and... Uh, yeah, I mean, it's self-made guy, and he was very successful, um, but rather ruthless and screwed a lot of people, including me. <laughs> uh, great interview. Thank you, Cornell. Uh, awesome. Thanks, Rich. That was fascinating. I always find mob guys to be super interesting, as do I. Cool. Uh, cool. Uh, so Hill's book is good bullshit. Exactly. Um, it's funny how many people swear on that book, but the man himself was not as legit. His Outwitting the Devil is one of the best books ever. Listened to it five times at least. So I'm not sure about his life, but his books are amazing. Yeah, and that's all that matters, right? Like, I think we put an unrealistic expectation on many gurus, like especially in the self-help field, expecting them to be super people, right? And that's just not the way it is. What was the most insightful takeaway from the interview for you? Um, well, I would say for Kim that the most insightful thing from the interview was the fact that as I started mentioning names, like I was like, do you know, did you know, like this person? He's like, little Dom, I knew Dom, right? And so that freaked Kim out that actually my stories of when I was a young kid, like being a gopher for these mob guys, was actually true, um, which not surprising to me. I mean, I lived it, so I assume that she believed me from the get-go. Um, but I would say that there's just an overall level of comfort in his own skin that was very clear to me. It was very obvious. Um, no different than maybe the way Mark Ford is or Jay Abraham is, how I hope that I kind of carry myself if, um, you know, in, in the same way. And I'd say that much more if there was something for me to take away from it, um, 
that you didn't see. It was primarily his presence, um, which really, I think, comes down to being as comfortable in your own skin as possible um, and carrying yourself in a way that, right, is both powerful and yet at the same time uh, caring or compassionate. Um, Rich, any tips on how to become a better storyteller? You know, it's really about practice at the end of the day, like many things, like being good on video or anything else. And what my friend uh, Michael Cage told me a long time ago was that he would go on walks and he would just tell stories incorporating what he was seeing as a way of practicing storytelling and um michael is an extremely good storyteller so i would say that that's probably not a bad strategy were you screwed before or after that interview i was screwed by my dad um almost 20 years ago yeah about 20 years ago so yeah way before the interview uh, uh my pleasure uh, question about regarding buying a hundred million dollar catalog from retiring internet marketer. Rick, I saw that and I hope you're not getting like taken advantage of. Um, so, okay. This person had, this person had a hundred million dollar business or they did a hundred million dollars in their total lifetime online. And then if they did a hundred million dollars in their total lifetime online, what, how many different offers did they have? And, uh, uh, let's see. Um, yeah, so I have a lot of questions about that, Rick. Um, sounds like it could be problematic just to give you a heads up. Rich, what's the greatest advice Jay Abraham ever gave me? Um, well, I think I've shared this, that the, the best thing I learned from Jay, he didn't teach me. It was more me witnessing him in action. And what I mean by that is, is that when I first sat down with him in a consult and I had read already a lot of his stuff at that time and, um, uh, the, uh, what I felt like I had learned lots of different strategies for marketing. What I learned when I watched him in action was, is that these were all filters of reality to solve any kind of problem, not just marketing problems. And I've gone into detail on that. So I don't want to go overboard there. Um, many different Johan Mock. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, I don't think it's as immensely sellable as you think it is, Rick. I know that's probably not what you want to hear, but if you haven't bought it, hopefully that helps. And if you did, um, hopefully you got resale rights so that at least you could sell it and make back your money relatively quickly. Uh, yeah, I knew that Napoleon Hill died bankrupt, so he didn't really walk the talk. I guess not, but his number one student, W. Clement Stone, um, hired him and became like the equivalent of a billionaire. So yeah. Uh, yes, they are super relaxed with themselves. There's a superpower, more reality one faces and more one faces all those little bullshit stories. We tell ourselves and take responsibility. The more chaos we can handle and bring order to it, the more relaxed we are. It's also a practice of just getting relaxed and getting to that zero point. It definitely is a superpower to have that relaxed dominant presence i agree stefan i think you're on to something there i think it is about a certain calmness in the midst of chaos that is incredibly appealing and attractive and i'm gonna really marinate on that um so i think we're gonna call it here um it's it's been a cr crazy week i'm still adjusting back to the time change and uh I'm still dying that my elliptical is not fixed yet. And I would say 
that um, I am looking forward to getting back fully in the groove. And uh, as I always say, I really appreciate you guys being here. Um, I appreciate you guys participating. I really appreciate you uh, watching that interview and giving me good feedback. Um, appreciate that a lot. I'm going to be releasing that video tomorrow. My hope is, is that it gets more, it helps boost my channel a bit. And, uh, you know, we will see if that actually happens. It'll be an interesting learning experience for me. And with that said, I just want to wish everyone a wonderful weekend and uh, that we will be back on Tuesday. I'm going to start cycling up my prep for these. So I will be more prepared as we actually start going on because we're getting a lot of things in place now so that these videos are, we're getting closer to being able to repurpose stuff and get it out there. So with all that said, stay tuned and uh, to higher profits and beyond, Rich Efren over and out.